Greetings and welcome. My name is Aaron Craig with Let's Learn This Together. And today we're gonna to be tackling sequences in Game Maker Studio. Sequences are a way of creating dynamic animations over time for your assets. And you can do this in a variety of ways. My favorite is to create cutscenes or to create fun animations for UI elements. It really helps bring your game to life and you can do it in such a quick way that you can get these things out in just minutes. So today we're gonna to be talking about how to create a sequence and add assets to it, how to use the track panel, how to use the dope sheet, keyframes, and animation curves. So let's go ahead and dive right in. What I've got running on the screen is a little introduction I created for the Yo-Yo Dungeon demo. Nothing in there officially, but it shows how to use sequences and the power of them to be able to get up and running really quickly. But before I dive into all of the elements of this, let's go ahead and break down what the sequences editor looks like and the features that are available to it, because it's a fair bit different than all of the other editors that they have. To start with, let's take a look at the canvas view. This is where everything you drag into your sequence, you can see. So the things that you can bring into your sequence are sprites, objects, sounds, animation curves, and more. Now you're not always gonna see them because you can control the life of those assets right here. So if I bring this cursor back a little bit, all of the bad guys are now gone. You can see that they're gonna come up here in a little bit and we're gonna tackle this portion called the dope sheet in just a minute. But the canvas view is where you see the animation play out. You've got rulers and guides for being able to tell exactly where the distance is between everything on the canvas view. And then we have the canvas toolbox up here in the right. Now, if you've been following along with some of the other tutorials or you've used much of Game Maker, you'll be familiar with the toolbox. And so the first five tools are very familiar with everything you've used elsewhere. But then we get to a few special tools like the gizmos. These gizmos control the things you can see in the sequences, and a lot of times these are really helpful tools. So these control things like the resources, the sound, the origin, the transform, the axes. By default, they're on, and I encourage you to leave them on. Then we have the transform gizmo. There are four different ways of using this. You've got translate, scale, rotate, and origin. And depending on which one you choose, the little arrows that pop up here will change. So on translate, we can move them around. If we change it to scale, we can actually grow it or rotate, we can move things around. Inside of translate, we can do pretty much all of those things as well, as you can see right here, except for the origin. If we bring that on, then we can change the origin right here. The origin is the origin of the sprite. So where you create it or set it, that's where it's gonna be. By default, the origin on all of these guys is bottom center. So we're not gonna change that now. And how you change it is with the transform gizmo. And then lastly, we have the canvas settings. So we can enable and disable the canvas frame. And this is just to be used as a reference when you're working with the sequence. If we move something outside of the canvas, it is still going to show up when we play that sequence, unless the room is actually the same size or smaller than our sequence, then those instances or images or whatever it is would actually be outside of the room, so we wouldn't be able to see them. You can change the width and height of your canvas, you can change the origin of it, and then you can also add an image reference. This is useful for taking a picture of your room. If you're having a cutscene take place inside of it, you can take an image of that, and then you can throw that image into your room. Now that image won't be imported into your game. It's not gonna be added. It's not gonna be in the sequence itself. It's just gonna be for reference. And when you do that, then you can change some of those options like the opacity and offset of that image. Now down here, we have how you actually control the sequence. We've got the track panel on the left and the dope sheet on the right. Now let's go ahead and create a new sequence and I'm gonna explain each of these as we add new assets. So in the asset browser, you right click and create sequence. It's just like any other asset you've got. So I'll call this SQ test, SQ being the prefix, and then we we'll have a brand new sequence. Inside here, we have a blank track panel and that's because we have nothing in it. We can click on this little icon and then we can choose any asset we want. I'll bring in O player and now they are right there. And along with that, the dope sheet has now filled up as well. So we can see that there's a bunch of information here. 
Starting on the left with the sequence tools, we've got the current frame that we're on. So we can change this by grabbing this cursor and moving it around. We can also type in a value here. We can also change it from frames to time if we wanted to. And we can also control the FPS of this sequence. We also have the ability to broadcast messages, add moments, and change the curve mode. These I'm not gonna to go too much in depth, but essentially a broadcast message allows you to send off a message that objects can pick up at a specific point in your sequence, and then they can react to. Moments allow you to add code directly inside of a sequence, and we're actually gonna talk about the curves when we get to the animation curves later on. This is where we can press play and scrub through left and right, and we can change the playback mode. And lastly, we have the length of the sequence. By default, it's set to 60, which is one second, so it's a really short one. But if we change it to something like 300, you can see now that the sequence plays for a lot longer. And if we press spacebar or play, well, our player's there and animating for a little bit, and then they disappear. And that's because over on the dope sheet here, this bar controls how long they're visible for. So we can drag this longer, we can right click, and we can say stretch asset key, which will take it all the way to the end. These red bars at the beginning and end control when the sequence starts and stops. So you can actually move those if you want, if you don't wanna play the entire sequence. But I'm gonna leave mine at the beginning and the end. Now, the power of sequences comes in because we have full control over keyframes and animation curves. So let's talk about keyframes first. So for every asset we bring in, we can control a bunch of different properties about them. By default, you start with zero. So over here on the left of the asset, there's sometimes an arrow. If you don't see it, then that means you don't have any properties that you are controlling yet. So we can click on this little plus add parameter track, and this is gonna show you all of the options you have available. Depending on the asset, you'll have different options. For this object, we have position, rotation, color multiply, image index, image speed, origin, and scale. So if I click on position, I now have a position down here with an X and Y coordinate that I can change and set at specific frames. So I'll move this back up to the beginning, and I'm gonna take this guy and drag him all the way outside of the sequence. Now, by doing that, I actually just made my first keyframe, and you can see that by this little white dot down here. If we drag the zoom tool in, or by pressing control and zooming in, we can zoom in to see this little keyframe. And if we click on it, it shows us that the X and Y is at negative 711 and zero. Now, by default, we have automatically record changes on. That means when we make a change to an asset, if it's at a new spot in the sequence, it's gonna record that. So if I zoom out and I go to 60 frames and I move our little player inwards, you can see it's created another keyframe and you can see how it moves between those two points. So we're going from all the way on the left to the middle of the room in 60 seconds. Now, if you don't wanna record keyframes automatically, you can turn this off. And instead what we can do is move up and we can press plus with the selected track and it makes a keyframe right there. Now, I don't need this one, so I'm gonna click on it and delete it. But now you can see how to add and delete keyframes. And the keyframes are the way you animate everything over time. So you wanna have complete control over that. To change a value, you can click on it and then move it if it's position, or you can actually change the value inside of here. So if I change this to negative 500, now it looks like he's moving super slow into that spot. You can do the same thing for all the other properties you can control and add keyframes as you move along. So you can begin to see how creating a cutscene can actually be done really quickly if you add all those keyframes to each individual spot you want to put in there. And now let's talk about animation curves. But right before we get into that, I'm gonna add one more point to our player by moving them over here, and then I'm going to press the record new key or F9. Now, I've got position selected, but if you had the player or the sprite or whatever it is you're using and you add a new keyframe, it might actually add a bunch of new properties depending because this object, these are the main properties that we have for it. So when we add a new keyframe for it, 
it adds all of these by default. The only one we really care about is position. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete these other ones. And now I'm gonna to toggle this curve mode. So right now we don't have any curves because, well, they're actually keys, they're not curves. We're moving from point A to point B in a linear fashion along an equal percent, but that's boring. So instead, let's go ahead and click on convert to curve. And now we have the option of changing the curve type. So what we can do is click on curves up here, and instead of a linear curve, we could change it to a smooth curve, and you can instantly see the difference here or we can change it to a Bezier curve, which is a fancy way of interpreting between points with a lot of options. If you've ever heard of easing, these are some easing presets that are built in. So if I click on elastic and I press play now, this is gonna actually look a lot different. So these Bezier curves give your animations a much more fluid and interesting way of moving from point A to point B, and there are a lot of options inside of here. And what's amazing is we can actually make our own animation curve. So if we click on this little hamburger menu and we go to export to shared curve and we open up our asset browser, we now have an animation curve. So if we click on this, this is an external animation curve that we can now share anywhere inside of our sequences and have multiple assets be using it the same way. And we can come in here and we can edit this even more. So the more you play with these, the more you're gonna find that there's incredible amount of diversity and flexibility for you inside of here. So by changing these values, we change where they're at, at over a given time. And any changes we make in here will reflect inside of our sequence as well. So I'm not gonna get too much into it because there's a lot of rabbit holes we could get down. But the idea is animation curves are a fun way to move from point A to point B, aside from the linear interpretation, which is just an equal percentage moved from step to step. So explore these new curves and definitely give sequences a try if you need any sort of animation for your game for cutscenes, UI, enemies, anything you can think of. Sequences are fantastic for all of it. But that's what I've got for you today. Thanks for joining me. If you enjoyed the video, leave a like. And as I like to say, keep making, keep learning, and I'll talk to you later.